you know, we were just a we were a normal everyday couple. We did everything together. We did outdoorsy things together. We went to the gym every day. You know, we were we would socialize like with you know the same group of people. Our main goal was just to work and be happy, travel. I had a just normal nine to five job. And then on the weekends, I was a sound engineer. My other hobby was surfing, you know, working out, trying to stay active and just, just living the, you know, normal, regular life. Our life changed instantly and we had to completely rebuild everything, our whole life. I woke up one day and I was minorly dizzy. It was a little bit like, what's this? Like something, something's not right. And after a few weeks of being like that, of just having this sensation inside of my head, I started to worry and I started to panic. The first thing I did was like, hey, let's get you to a doctor and like see if they can, you know, get you some medicine just to calm down because their anxiety was out of control. Finally, I went to my primary care physician. I went to her office no, without an appointment, hysterically crying, hysterically screaming. And I told her, I said, I think I'm dying. I said, I think I have a brain tumor. I think I have MS or I think I'm dying. I think there's something very, very wrong with me. And she ordered me an emergency MRI. She called me and Mike was with me and she said, you're fine. And I said, that's, that's not possible. You feel like uh, helpless because you're just like, well, nobody knows what's wrong. We have no course of treatment. Like there's nothing they can suggest to even help the situation. It's just a complete mystery. So you aren't, you feel, you know, helpless and hopeless. There's no brain tumor, there's no MS, there's nothing like that. So like, that's a, so we know that. And then I started to calm down and things improved after about a month. And then on January 5th of 2020, Mike had left the house to go to the gym. And as I was doing laundry, I got extreme vertigo and I dropped to the floor completely dropped to the floor. I began vomiting immediately and I couldn't get up. My heart was beating so fast. I felt like I was having a heart attack. I don't remember getting to the hospital. I don't remember anything. And I, you know, I thought, all right, she's gonna be in here for a while cause she's pretty, pretty messed up. So I was like, let me go home situate the dogs and then come back and get ready for like a long night and when i got back to my house she called me and she said they're you know we're done they're they said i'm fine so they're discharging me i was like okay like what so i got back and she was in a wheelchair and i took her home and it was the most confusing thing ever who do i call who am i like who am i supposed to see about this like where do i even Begin. In the morning, he would make sandwiches for me and he would lay them out on the bedside table and he would put fruit there. So everything that I needed for the day had to be within reach. All I knew was this girl can't get out of bed. I've got to go to work. <laughs> yeah. Got to, you know, come home during work, take care of the dogs and go back to work you know, get food, like keep everything going. I literally had no time to like, even like sit and think about it. He would have to help me shower at night. He would have to sit, he would have to sit in the bathroom with me while I sat on the floor of the shower stall. He would have to help me put my clothes on. He would have to help me walk. I couldn't go downstairs. I couldn't do anything. I would just sit there. He lost me as a partner and he lost me as his best friend. 
my world became so small, I didn't know anything else at the time, but Mike still had to live in this big, huge world. And I gave him all the space that he needed. I gave him the option to leave. He obviously didn't leave, but you know, I made sure that he knew that whatever he needed to do to get through these hard times, that it was okay with me. You know, people, they would ask me, how you doing? How you feeling? I'm like, well, I mean, I'm, I feel fine, but Etta doesn't feel fine. And that my focus was trying to take care of her and help her to get better. It took from the time that I dropped to the time that I finally got to a doctor, I went to an ENT, was 13 days. He said, I know what's wrong with you, but I don't know what to do about it. And I said, what's wrong with me? Please tell me. He said, you have vestibular migraine. And I said, what is that? He said that there's a specialist where we live. So there's a specialist in Charleston, South Carolina. And he said, I can put in a referral for you, but it's gonna take up to six months. And he was not wrong. I went on online and I read as much as I could. And I went to social media almost immediately to start trying to find people that had also had this because I was like, these people are going to need to tell me what to do. Gave her a, a lot of relief to hear someone else talk about their symptoms that matched exactly what she was going through. So it gave her a little bit of hope, like, all right, you know, there's some people out there dealing with this that, you know, I'm not crazy, like, this is real, and, mm -hmm. you know, other people are experiencing these symptoms. So that, that helped us a lot to be like, all right, well, let's, let's keep digging and researching. And he was so good. He would just come home and sit with me on the bed and we would just watch these videos one right after the other. And we would just go through all these people on social media and reach out to them. And we were both in just survival mode. After seven months, I did get in with a specialist and he confirmed my diagnosis. It was a relief to know, but he also confirmed this isn't, this isn't gonna be a quick fix. And after that was when everything started to get really dark and I realized this isn't gonna, this isn't going away. It's really difficult, like, because I think to myself, like, I'm gonna have to deal with this on some level for the rest of my life. And sometimes I'm like, I'm okay with that. And then other times like this, where everything just is like flared up and I'm having so many symptoms, it's just so hard. Like I started looking into options of ending my life and making arrangements for him after. And I thought, I'll just go to Switzerland and do this and, and figure, you know, and and do this in a, in a semi, like, peaceful way. And he, um, he said, well, we're not going to do that. Let's work on a, you know, plan to, to get better and let's try some stuff before we just say, okay, well, let's, let's just end it. So. And I said, I, I have nothing left in me it's gone everything that i had left in me is it's over for me and he said it's not it feels like it but it's not he called a priest to come to the house and that was something that i was pretty against and i said no i don't want to do that but we got an orthodox priest to come to the house he spent a long time with us really talking to us about you know what it is to be sick and what that means and how this just happens 
and you didn't do anything to cause this. And if it was your time, it would be over. And I said, how do I not know it's over right now? He said, because you're sitting here breathing. That's when things changed. Things, things started to slowly, slowly turn around. I sat in my bed and cried for an entire year, hoping and wishing that I would wake up and be the same person that I was before. And I had to realize that's not happening. I don't worry about or think about how it used to be and mm -mm. you know how things used to be normal. Now this is our new normal and we just have to live with it and, and accept it. Mm -hmm. and but it's, it's not okay. a bad, bad thing. It's okay to see someone slowly go through the healing process has really turned me into a compassionate person. Seeing this happen to her really changed the way I look at things. And a lot of people will be like, oh, this person's crazy and they're just making it up. And you know, now I realize that- We got a lot the, of that. Yeah, people aren't making this up. They don't wanna be at home sick. They're not doing it on purpose. Mm -hmm. And that's what changed a lot for me. I was able to go see Katy Perry and I was crying the whole time because I was like, I cannot believe I went from being in my bed for a year and not leaving my house to being able to stand in this room in Las Vegas watching world-class entertainment. I was like, don't give up guys because the life that you can have can be incredible again. It can be. It's not gonna be the same. We gotta let that go. That's gotta go. But it can be incredible again. And for me to be able to do something like that, I was like, I'm 41 years old crying at a Katy Perry concert. But this is like, this is such, this is such a big deal for me to be able to do this, you know?